people. Episode 21, recorded the 27th of the 10th. Hi and welcome again to The Valley's People. This is the program in which we meet uh, so many people from the Hunter Valley who have contributed to our current lifestyle and our sporting interests and our social interests and in fact the cultural life of the Valley. And today we're going to meet a sportsman as we have so many sportsmen in the Hunter Valley. This one has represented Australia for 26 occasions. And also we're going to meet an entertainer from Islington who uh, at one particular stage of his career reckoned he could answer 10,000 separate riddles. Hope you can stay for today's episode. Thanks for joining us today. First guest, as you may have guessed from the introduction, someone who's represented uh, the Hunter Valley and uh, Australia for 26 test occasions, could really be no one else except Hunter Valley cricketer Gary Gilmore. Welcome to the Valley's people, Gary. Thanks very much, Ron. In fact, I guess, uh, probably apart from a few newspaper men, I'd be the only person calling you Gary, because everyone I know calls you Gus. You know, when, when somebody calls me Gary these days, I, I don't answer it, because <laughs> I remember primary school, when I was, must have been in third class, when I was about seven or eight, they stuck me with this role of Gus the theatre cat and so I was, I was the theatre cat and ever since that day I've got Gus and like I doubt if anyone walking along the street or um, or anybody in Newcastle would call me Gary so Gus it is and although my parents don't like it they, uh, <laughs> I think they've learned to put up with it. Well most parents don't like nicknames <laughs> do they? I tell you I was talking to Bobby Simpson a little while ago and he said if you're going to talk to Gary Gilmore don't ask him about Gus, but ask him about the other name, Jake. <laughs> how, do, how do the cricketers call you Jake? Well, see, or should I know? <laughs> well, you know that famous Ralph Harris song that, um, about Jake the pig? Right. Well, it's got nothing to do with that sort of connotation, but Dennis Lilly has given me this, this Jake name because a couple of years ago I was troubled by a foot injury, and I used to walk with a limp virtually all the time for <laughs> about the whole season. And he reckoned that anybody with the limp like that couldn't, would have to be walking on three legs. So I, uh, I got Jake, and in cricket circles, like in New South Wales and Australia, it's Jake, and when I come back here, it's Gus. Yeah, well, I guess your customers uh, at, the, at the sports world call you Gus, and uh, cricketers call you Jake. No one calls you Gary except Mum and Dad. Yeah, except Mum and Dad, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gus, uh, 26 times for Australia is, uh, of course, a magnificent achievement. When we look at the last decade of cricket within the Hunter Valley, we're really talking about, uh, from representative point of view, we're talking about Watkins, uh, Doug Walters and yourself, aren't we? That's right, I don't yeah. think I've missed anyone. Um, now, in those tests, uh, looking back on them, can you still recall the time that you might have been given your first bat and ball? How did you prepare for that? So, both my parents were very keen sportsmen. My father was a, a top-grade tennis player, and like still was until a couple of years ago. He was getting a bit long in the tooth and took up bowls. But I think it was a natural progression, like with the parents being sportsmen, they, um, they were hoping that their children would be sportsmen. And like we'd played tennis, my brother and myself played tennis and cricket in the backyard, because we had very understanding neighbours in those days, and they're still living there. But uh, I play with my young cousins and nephews over there now, and uh, still hit balls over the back fence, and we still don't get any, any complaints. But, but like being, with, from a sporting family, not, not only my parents, but my aunties and uncles were badminton players. So I was involved in sport virtually from, from when I was born and it was inevitable that I was going to play one sport sooner or later. When, Gary, did you realise that you obviously had a little more talent than other people with the bat and ball? And so when did you have to make that transition to tackle it very seriously? Well, cricket, cricket wasn't my first love when I was, when I was young. Um, like my brother and myself were, we used to team up and win a lot of 
tennis tennis championships. But when we got to the formative years, when I think temper started coming into the game, um, my brother and myself realised that we weren't cut out to be playing tennis with with each other, so we we gave it away. Um, it wasn't too much fun standing on the net and getting a ball in your back, no. in the middle of your back, because you missed a shot, <laughs> the shot before. So, like we gave up tennis, and like cricket was my next love, and I took up cricket when I was about nine or ten. And you really kept at it then as a career. The uh, Out of all those tests, uh, would there be a memorable one? I guess it's a pretty stock question, but just the same. There must be something in your mind that distinguishes one particular test. I think the two most memorable tests were, were tests that weren't completed, uh, that I was involved in anyway. I remember a test in England in 1975 where, uh, where a group of people who crawled under the covers at Leeds one night and cut up the wicket with a, yeah. with a knife and fork. Um, we were in a pretty bad position that night, or that game anyway. And uh, that saved our throats a little bit because uh, I think we were, on the, uh, we were on the way to a defeat. But that always sticks in my, in my memory because it was my first overseas test series and I just didn't think those things those things happened. No, vandalism in cricket was something. That's new. right, yeah. And um, the other one was in West Indies about two years ago. Where, um, I've just been reading a book by Ray Robinson, who's a, probably the most renowned cricket writer of all times. And he said this test in Guyana must rate as one of the worst, worst rides of all times. And like we were in a position there where we couldn't play because it was raining. Um, and eventually we had to, the umpires had to say, well, we can't play for another hour or two. And by this time, about three o'clock in the afternoon, the West Indian people have had a couple of bottles of rum, rum under their belt for the last, since three o'clock in the morning when they got into the ground. And things got a bit, a bit hot and there was a riot. And uh, it was just like a, one big wave of people converging over the ground and coming straight to our dressing room. And it took about an hour for the police to arrive. And, and at that time, the walls of our dressing room were just starting to to shake under the pressure that was going on outside. And like we feared, we feared for our life. And I must confess, I I hit the deck a couple of times. With uh, I fainted once because we were all in there with our bats and helmets on, prepared to take someone down with us if we were going to get a yeah. a broken bottle in the stomach. So, like just as the wall was going to give way, the tear gas arrived and disperse the crowd but yeah their memories like, now but I can imagine they're a bit terrifying at the time eh? well after that test after that test in Guyana like everybody says right we're going home because it's it's not worth it with it when, when you've got a, a wife and a couple of kids it's not yeah. it's not worth being stabbed over just a game of cricket so no. we're all in the same boat and we, and we all wanted to go home but we stayed on and um, just to, just to show them really that they uh, the crowd didn't run cricket and Right. We got a great reception the next day. Yeah, so the two memorable moments in, like in Test cricket, actually didn't have anything to do with performance. But what was your uh, s sort of uh, the most memorable performance in your own in your own right? Um, I think a one-day game in England in '75 in the semi-final of the Prudential Cup. Uh, we went over there as underdogs to to get our pants whipped by the Poms, and um, we got to the semi-final against them and. We bowled them out for, I think it was 93 or 97 or something like that. And I got six for 14 on a, on a morning that was quite conducive to my sort of bowling. And like it was more the conditions that got me the wickets and not as much ability. But I got six for 14 then. We went out and I think we were six, six out for 39. And, it was my, and I went into bat and Doug Waters was there luckily. And um, we managed to knock the runs over. But... I think that, that performance there yeah. sticks in my mind the most. Yes, you obviously measure these things against the task at hand, and that's more satisfying. That's right, because I've, I've been written in the papers that I wasn't, I wasn't able to handle a critical situation that I'd always packed it in. And, and like that, that day there, when, um, like when I got out, it was only Max Walker to come in, and Max is not too flash with the bat at the best of times, so it was really up to Doug and myself too. To, to score the runs, and, and we did. Yeah, I can see now why those three memories uh, linger mm. long in the mind, uh, Gary. Uh, being an all-rounder, um, 
well, I sort of Alan Davidson of the Central Coast of many years ago. <laughs> uh, batting and bowling, do you have a particular preference? All depends, really. Um, how you're performing at that time, like you, you can't sustain one performance all the year round. So, if you're bowling well, you prefer bowling. If you're batting well, you prefer batting. And if you're not doing both very well, you you prefer not being picked. <laughs> yes, I thought your devilment might produce an answer on that one because when I asked you whether you prefer batting and bowling, I was sure you were going to say rugby union. Yes. No, I think that you're still fascinated by rugby, aren't you? Yeah, I'm. I'm a great rugby union follower. Um, I've played rugby in Newcastle and gave it away a couple of years ago when I just kept on breaking bones. But I'm a keen supporter of a, of a club up here now and uh, you can usually find me there every Saturday afternoon <laughs> enjoying the, the company of fellow rugby players. Gary, I guess most of us can uh, you know, visualise the, the problems of playing cricket under what must be six or more television mm. cameras, but could you describe it for us? Because in the early days uh, you, you weren't so close up as you now are, but you were full face. Uh, back into the lounge room all over Australia, aren't you? That's right. Like early on, when there's only two a camera at each end, you could you could get away with a lot of things, like that you say in the heat of the moment, or or say when you're walking back to your bowling mark, you might say something to a bloke fielding near you. But the days of two cameras are gone, and now with when you're looking at eight or a dozen cameras and microphones in the ground, well, you can't really say anything, and. Um, of course, no matter what, 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 you, what you say or what you do, you're bound to get someone who's going to, uh, some camera that's going to pick you up. So you're, you're aware of what's going on. But that's what I was going to ask you. Are you forewarned, uh, sort of almost lectured, uh, where the, where the uh, microphones are and so on? Not really. Like um, when, when Kerry Packer was involved in, in, in the cricket scene, um, like the microphones in the ground were, were new. Hmm. We're a new innovation, and we we were told, or were threatened with fined, if if some words come over the TV or some actions came out, which um, which wasn't our fault because with like the the delay button button on the on the microphone, like the producer or the director had seven seconds to cut it out, yes. but some kept on getting over the uh, on air, so we were threatened with a thousand dollar fine, which. Um, which was a, a fair slug, which you couldn't really afford, so you were better off shutting up. So you didn't have to write a cheque out at any stage? Not really, no. <laughs> Not for that. <laughs> Gary, what is it now? Are you quite content to, uh, to serve in Gary Gilmore's uh, sports world uh, shop? Uh, wh what's the future? Not really, no. I'm, I'm still only 29. Um, I like to think that I've still got some cricket left in me. Um, I suppose I've been lucky that since I've had the shop, I've... Um, well, last year I got dropped from the sh from the shield side just when we were opening the shop up, and by being dropped was good in one way because it gave me a bit of time to spend mm. spend in the early the early months of the shop, and uh, which which looking back was it was a good thing. But now with the shop like sort of established, and I know I've still got some cricket left in me. Mm. Um, I like to think the shop can run itself, and I can get back on the playing fields again. <laughs> Well, we hope so. But what about the young kids of the Hunter Valley, Gary? Uh, just how seriously must they approach cricket now if they're going to get to the top uh, now that we have such excellent standards? Um, cricket takes a lot of time, a lot of practice. Um, I know once kids start getting into grade clubs, when you're, when you're practicing two or three times a week, um, it's not really enough. Look, I, I think if a person's going to make it, He's got to put at least about eight or ten hours of practice in a week by himself to um, to, to correct any faults or or just to improve his game. It's just a matter of time, um, and there's only one way you can improve your cricket, and that's by playing cricket. Um, well, so they've got to be as dedicated as you've been. Or oh, probably a bit more. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, Gary Gilmore, Gus Gilmore, Jake Gilmore, thanks very much for appearing on the Valley's People today. And uh, on behalf of the people in Hunter Valley, it's congratulations on what you've done, not only for cricket in Australia, but for cricket in this valley of ours. Thanks very much, Ron.
Second guest today is uh, a man that's been entertaining children in the Hunter Valley for as long as I think most grown-ups, not children, but most grown-ups can remember. Uh, a man at one stage uh, of radio performances in the Hunter Valley could rightfully claim to know every riddle that was then in vogue, and that's Rex Sinclair, Uncle Rex, magician, ventriloquist, and I might say social worker. Welcome to the Valley's people. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you. I don't think anyone's really asked you whether you knew the answers to all of those 10,000 riddles, but I picked the figure out when I, when I think of you uh, in a line of children every Friday in, uh, in Newcastle Radio with about 20 kids in line, all coming up to ask you a riddle. And of course it was a contest because if you didn't know the answer to the riddle, I think they got a Victor ice cream brick. That's right. Uh, so you really had to be on your medal. But I've just multiplied one year's uh, riddles by at least 10 or more, and I get something like that. And you know how far back you're going, too. No, not really. Oh, too far. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember you when you was a small boy in the audience. Can you remember that yes, far back? Yes, I think I can. Because I had I, less wrinkles. <laughs> yeah, but I was very much a fan, I can assure you. <laughs> yes, I'll have a good old days. Yes. Rex, it always in intrigued me. You seem to know the answer to every riddle, but uh, do you remember any that you were stumped on? Oh, yes, there's been quite a few. Quite a few. I remember one. I'll ask you the riddle and see if you know the answer. What did the health inspector say to his wife when he came home from work? I don't know. What did the health inspector say to his wife when he came home from work? Hygiene. Oh. I know, well, it's corny. That gives our viewers some indication of the standard <laughs> of uh, radio in those days. But yeah. there were a couple of others, weren't there? That, uh... Oh, yes. Um, why? What's the difference between the capital of Australia and the garbage man? I don't know. What is the difference between this the capital of Australia and the This was a very popular one man? years ago. There's no difference. They are both can bearers. Oh, Rex. Oh, they get worse. Do you keep up? <laughs> oh, please, no. Do you keep up with the new ones? Like, let me ask you one. <clears throat> How do you get a paper baby? Oh, see, now you, you're catching right it's up modern on school time. age How stuff. How do you get a paper is? bag? A paper Oh, it's coming to me. Marry an old bag. See? Uh, like an ice cream brick. I can't really <laughs> toss it. Uh, Rex, you've been uh, with uh, magic and ventriloquism, I guess, so you, since you can remember. But uh, when did it all start? And why? Well, in my early days, and I say early, just school leaving days, I was a fitter and turner by trade. I couldn't dance. I couldn't sing. I couldn't recite. So I had to do something when I went to these parties. A male wallflower, you know, it's not it. So I saw an ad in the paper, how to be a magician. Send two and six to Andrade's in Sydney and learn to be a magician. <laughs> and also how to be a ventriloquist, another two and six. So I invested the total sum of five shillings, sent down, and that started me off. A five bob start. Five bob start. Oh, incredible. That is incredible. And you actually was a correspondence course. <laughs> it was really, yes. But then there were travelling shows all the way around the place, and I'd go behind stage if there was a magician or a ventriloquist on and help to carry his bag down to the, the tram or the train as it was in those days. and ask him all sorts of questions. It was really learning the hard way. I think we could probably sense some atmosphere from that Australian film, The, the Picture Show Man, out in the yes, back. Yes, it was a very, very, very parallel to the old travelling showman. But the travelling showman had to be very versatile. They had perhaps a, a motor car, a T-model Ford, or a little later on. The person who drove the car at least had to be a pianist or show the slides for the community singing or take the tickets on the door or be chucker out. It had to be somewhere in that line. And every artist had to go on twice or three times plus take part in what we call blackout sketches. Yes. They didn't shut the curtain or fade out. No on curtain. The no. As <laughs> soon as you got to the tagline of the sketch, blackout. And you laughed in blackness, you know, and then the lights came on again. Another bracket of community singing while I thought up something else or the next act got ready. Well, is that how you fell off the stage once? Because one of your friends told me you fell off the Ooh, stage. Oh, I didn't fall off it. I fell through it. Really? We were taking part in a sketch in which there were three parsons. We had to dress up with that stiff collar back the front and our waistcoat back the front. That's how we changed quickly. Went on and we uh, passed a few... Uh, burlesque announcements for next week's items, yeah, like the, uh, the uh, Harvest Festival next Sunday will be hauled in the hell beneath, I mean held in the hall beneath, 
or uh, the ladies that bring eggs along for the harvest festival, will you please lay them on the front seat? The preacher for next Sunday will be found hanging in the porch. Different things like that. You'd say a few and then you'd take a step forward and say, oh yes, I think so. You see, like that. But I took a step forward, but the silent pictures were on uh, on other nights and they had cellophane, coloured cellophane, over hidden lights in the stage. Well, I stepped forward to say, oh yes, I think so, and I went straight down one of these pits, up to about here. And I had to think very, very quickly that time, so I looked at the audience, of course you can't see them with a spotlight on you, and said, brethren, beware of the pitfalls of life. That's <laughs> the way we got out of it, and black out on that. Hell of a line for a travelling preacher. <laughs> yes, it was a hard way of getting the blackout <laughs> laugh too. Rex, I think any time that uh, I've known you, I don't think uh, you've ever really worked in smokos or pubs or very few clubs. You've always, your whole life seems to be working for children in the Hunter Valley. Is that right? Yes, there is much more enjoyment in working for children. From a ma magician's point of view, when they're small children, you are a magician. When they're teenagers, it's a puzzle. Right. And they want to find out and let you know how it's done. But when you get to the sophisticated, sometimes a little abbrevi in, abbreviated, that's a big word for me, um, they uh, don't want to be in it. You're trying to put it over on them so they don't want to be in it. Yes. So you can see all the enjoyment is for children. Yes. So you're in the, in the world of fascination. Back with that's the right. The Wizard of Oz days. Yes. Now, does that mean, well, does that explain, really, why you are so closely linked, and you have been for a decade or more now, with the, the children's theatre? Yeah, the Young Indiana. People's Theatre at Hamilton uh, take great pride in my little department. They have uh, pottery, uh, uh, basket work, and uh, mainly dramatic acting. They produce shows, but they added, after puppetry, mag a, a magician's class, you see? And they picked on me as the tutor for the magicians. And I've had more success than I ever even thought of. One of my lads won Channel 3's uh, Quest the variety oh, show good. during the year. Very good, Rex. Hmm. If the kids remember you for riddles, uh, you also work at the other end of the scale, don't you? The, the elders of the valley, and if they'll remember oh, you for yes. those cards that you always seem to bring out. You've got hundreds of these things. Oh, yes. I still see the elderly citizen. I'm one of them, but any time they've got a show, who do they pick on for their compare or to fill in a bit of time? And well, if you don't I... mind me saying, now that we're in the world of corn, mm -hmm. <laughs> how about some of these cards? Right, right. Because uh, you, you bring these out to uh, elderly now, people's homes. I call them alfs. Alfs. I don't know why I call them alfs. Something long time ago. All right. Called them alfs. Now there you are. It's a cross between something for the art gallery and a puzzle. Yeah. You've got to guess what it is. You've right? got to tell me what that means. Well, I'm going to say I don't know to all of these, so we can find out. I don't know. Well, it's a very simple one. It's a sock in the eye. Sock in the a eye. A sock in the eye. Ask a silly question. Right. More, More corny than the riddles. Cars? Want another one? Yes, please. Right, then. There we are. I know that one. You know that one? Yeah, diving board. A right? diving board, yes. Right. See, being a cartoonist as well, it helps a little <laughs> bit to, to be able to draw these. You won't get the next one. There were 50 years of show business in there. You won't get this one. That's what, a B in his hand there? That's a B. Yes. And That's uh, a capital I. Be uh, no, I don't know. You don't know? I and B. Well, it's a, no, an expression know. that we sometimes use. Beauty in the eye of the beholder. Oh, Rex. Got it? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, what, one more before. One more, right oh Yes. A very simple one. There you are now. You do your best about that. Well, a century minus a C, isn't it? Uh, what, mm. uh, half a century? No. No? Don't know. Well, a century is a long time, isn't it? Right, 100 years, yes. There's no C. So it's a long time, no C. <laughs> oh, Rex, no. Oh, I'm sorry I asked all those. Uh, yeah, like uh, yeah when is he going to ask me a question? Oh, no. Horace as well? Yeah. Rex and Horace. Hello, Horace. Welcome to the Valley's people, old boy. Thank you very much. Your hair's grown a lot since I saw you last time. Oh, you've got to be in the fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Rex, if we can get bypass Horace for a moment, because there's one thing I do want to find out about ventriloquism. That's the story about the particular alphabet. There's some letters you can't say because your lips move. Is that right? Oh, yes. The alphabet complete except three words, three letters. Right. B, P, or M. 
BPM. See, if I had to say pretty Polly... It'd come out itty Ollie. Okay, That's nice. right, you see, if I don't move my li lips, it's itty Ollie. Yes. So you'd try and bypass those words, and the letter M, well, it comes out like, hmm. Yeah. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Horace. <laughs> don't lose your hair, Bob. Your wig slipping. <laughs> Yeah, so there's three letters. That's right. Ah, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how you attempt to minimise the... Uh, that's how you the, attempt the to minimise it. And of course, yeah. if you must say them, you look at the doll's face and take your face away from the audience. Like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's still quite an art because you can throw your voice into suitcases oh, and across yes, the wall. And that's right. Ball. But it's all misdirection. Misdirection. What do you mean by that? Well, when you go to the talkies and you see Mickey Mouse or somebody on the screen, that's not even ventriloquism. That voice was added later. The voice could be from there, there, or there, but it's still coming from a speaker in the middle. Yes. It's the eye and ear suffer from the illusion. Yeah. Well, there's been... Uh, I'm only an illusion. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and Horace, uh, your Uncle Rex has, uh, has been providing uh, illusion and magic and, uh, and, and joy to so many people over so many years in Hunter Valley that we ought to thank you on behalf of them all. Rex yeah. Sinclair? Thank you. Uh, on behalf of tonsillitis, I thank you. <laughs> That's a pain in the neck. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Rex. Thank you. Goodbye and goodbye, Horace. Thank you. Well, I thought we only had time for two guests. We ended up with three. Horace, Rex Sinclair, and of course the man who's represented Australia 26 times in cricket, Gary Gilmore. I hope you can join us again in our next program of The Valley's People when two more identities from our own living area join us in this program. Hope you can too.